Please help me welcoming Amit. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sena. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and um, uh, thanks a lot for joining me this evening, uh, spending a couple of uh, uh, one and a half hours uh, of talking about is learning on my agenda. And here comes a gentleman, you know, uh, asking them a question, asking you a question, saying, is learning on my agenda? Of course, it is on my agenda. Why do you, you know, I used to get, uh, I normally get a lot of questions like this. Why, Amit, why are you asking this kind of a question? Learning has been on my agenda all my life. And uh, my parents, you know, put in so much of money, hard work in making sure that I was educated. But I keep smiling and keep asking them the same question as, as much as I'm going to ask you, is learning on your agenda? So we'll continue to uh, reflect on this particular question through the um, entire session. And um, like you heard that there are going to be goodies, you know, all of us, irrespective of our age, mental age, physical age, we all love goodies, right? So I've also, um, I also want to promise you a few goodies which I'm carrying with me, which are there with me in the white bag that you see there. Because I want to make this session interactive. I want to talk to you. I want to hear your perspectives as well. And uh, as I ask you a specific question, uh, the person who raises his or her hand is where the question is addressed to. And if the answer is correct, we celebrate with a goodie. Is that OK? Are you all with me? Yes. All right. Wonderful. So is learning on your agenda? I would like to start with sharing a few perspectives, uh, perspectives uh, which I've captured from uh, my, my reading, which I've captured through uh, my conversations with various chief learning officers across the globe. Uh, I've been in the learning space for several years, and uh, it has helped me interact with a variety of people and continues to allow me to interact with a variety of people just uh, spoke at Vegas last month on technology-aided learning at a tech conference uh, uh, represented by ATD. So I intend to bring some, some of those learnings in these uh, slides. Uh, and there will be some videos as well. Hopefully, some of them will bring smile on your faces, right? And of course, uh, quiz and some amount of interaction. All right? So um, this particular uh, study that I want to share with you through these visuals was conducted by uh, Thomson Reuters. And you've heard of Thomson Reuters. They are very, uh, very much into consulting, into uh, finding, uh, doing a lot of research. And they did some research which they published about two years ago. And uh, some of the research that has been done by them, you will for years yourself see that you know, there has been an improvement, there is a movement. Whatever they are predicting, things are moving in that direction. So some of those uh, predictions for 2025 by Thomson Reuters are that Star Trek is going to be a reality. So if you've, we grew up uh, uh, watching Star Trek videos, uh, teleportation is by 2025 will be tested. So, so we're getting there. Type 1 diabetes is going to be preventable. That is the, the amount of research that is going on uh, in this area. And solar will be the largest source of energy on our planet. So I, while I understand that reliance is very much into hydrocarbons, yeah, but we certainly need to be mindful of the fact that this is the direction in which the world is moving. Drug development, cancer, certain types of cancers, uh, you know, the, uh, the amount of toxic effects, side effects of uh, chemotherapy, uh, toxic effects of radiotherapy, those will be much better taken care of. And some of uh, these diseases will be better managed. Dementia, Alzheimer's disease, you know, will be things of past. You know, a lot of research is moving in that direction. Uh, this is where, um, you know, Geo is one such example and many such telecom companies across the globe, you know, you're seeing that digital convergence is happening. Now machines have started talking to each other rather than just the, the you know, a machine to uh, an individual contact. There is a conversation happening. Uh, the cloud is exponentially growing and uh, we are seeing a huge amount of uh, movement in this area. Um, food shortages are going to be things of the past. I, I'm, 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 this is one very, very important one. I mean, if we are able to achieve this, 
uh, as 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 a world i think this is going to be a great great achievement for the mankind not that uh, you know uh, you know we have, the, the problem is we are not able to manage food better you know being perishable across we are not able to manage it better across we are not able to predict the demand and supply and uh, that's where advances in 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 technologies is really going to help us bridge that gap dna mapping at birth uh, you know like what the astrologers did for us would you know uh, come up with loads and loads of papers of data and saying this is what your child is going to be right so dna mapping will be able to help us uh, reach very very clearly to forecast what kind of uh, uh, you know uh, what kind of a uh, business or or uh, kind of uh, a job that this person is going to be moving into which direction this person is going to be moving into what will be his likes dislikes and so on and so forth so, but uh, here the dna mapping is specifically from a perspective of predicting if there will be certain defects certain diseases that can be prevented or that can be better managed electric air transportation uh, while we have seen the drones we have seen how drones have changed the lives are or and are changing the lives from a security angle from a from a perspective of uh, movie uh, creation right uh, so we've seen that but you know passenger movement using aircrafts which are powered by electricity is something which is going to be uh, a reality in 2025 or maybe sooner a beaten to death kind of a term but but still very very important though it's a cliche term it's extremely important for us to keep ourselves reminding ourselves on a day to day basis that we are living in an uncertain world so so i'm not going to be asking you any question around what is the full form of vuca i know each one of us and especially from a security perspective if you if if i share a trivia with you this term was coined way back in the early 90s in the army itself so this is not a marketing or a business language right so we're living in an uncertain and a volatile world but what is important and here this is where i'm going to share a few slides uh, from uh, my research that i did by going through the ernst and young study on vuca and this is what they have to say um, they say that you know the role of leadership is something which is going to be extremely important in a, in an uncertain world the world that we are all living in so how do we really manage ourselves how do we how do we manage our teams how do we manage our client relationships how do we keep our teams engaged motivated driven by a sense of purpose that is going to be an extremely important element the use of technology smack as we say social media uh, social mobility right analytics and cloud the, how is it going to impact and how can we leverage the uh, the availability of social uh, media the availability of analytics the the access to cloud how can we leverage all of this to really address the problems of today as well as problems of future and the fact that we are living in a flat world cultural alignment is extremely important you know understanding uh, that we all come from different backgrounds we uh, socio economic backgrounds cultural backgrounds diversity is so very very important for us to be able to i mean i spend uh, after becoming um, uh, uh, you know after leaving infosys and getting into an entrepreneurial uh, space the amount of time that i'm spending on skype and on zoom is phenomenal and and the kind of conversations that i have right from japan to mexico to us i mean each of these conversations are very unique and very different and i really have to study hard i really have to understand the psychology the cultural aspects of the people that i am engaging with uh, and especially since i'm engaging with them over a virtual uh, medium so it's important that we all understand the cultural alignment and equally important is how do we really uh, utilize our internal capacity our internal capability of human resources of people like you and me are we really preparing them for the future are we all getting ready getting prepared and also um, not only uh, prepared but appreciative of these sudden changes and some of these slides i'll share with you will further you will be able to appreciate what i mean by frequent changes right so internal capability and that's the reason i chose this particular topic i chose this particular slide to share with you that in the internal uh, in the vuca world internal capability management augmentation 
is extremely crucial, extremely important. We are all, end of the day, um, leaders in our own right, whether we are leading large teams, whether we are leading individuals, whether we are leading uh, you know, a smaller team or a, you know, in a matrix organization where our people are all uh, dispersed. End of the day, if we are not able to communicate effectively, if we are not able to coach our people effectively, if we are not able to inspire them, if we are not able to give them the vision, then we are not playing a role of a leader. So a leader can also be or should also be a any fill in the blanks for a leader should also be a a coach, a facilitator, a teacher, a trainer. The taxi industry, how VUCA world has changed, how these four things that you saw, the role of leadership, technology, culture, and internal capability planning, it took almost 35 years for the taxi industry in the Western world to evolve, to become a GPS-enabled industry. And it took less than five years for companies like Uber, companies like Lyft, and, and similar, like in, in the Indian context, the Olas of the world, for us to really, really augment and become uh, really, um, you know, maximize ourselves, ex expand exponentially. I call it as the disruptive model, right? Today we are talking about mass transportation using, using um, you know, this GPS technology. We are talking about, um, you know, Wi-Fi enabled fleets. We are talking about introduction of motorcycle uh, cabs in areas where, you know, uh, four wheelers can't move. So that's, that's the power of uh, the shift that we are seeing and the impact that it can make. Any, any examples of disruptive, uh, where technology has really helped disrupt the business models? Any example? Photography. Photography, yes, absolutely. Look at, look at the amount of data that we've created on the cloud. And it has given a huge meaning to cloud-based uh, you know, uh, offerings. Great. Any other example? IPods. Sorry? IPods, iPods shopping, telecommunications. telecommunications. Look at what demonetization did to us. Did VUCA model didn't apply there? It did. Look at what happened to Paytm. Grew exponentially. They were prepared. And wherever they were unprepared, they made quick changes. Now they're, make, they're making themselves, you know, we're talking about cultural alignments. You know, so, so now their uh, apps are uh, multilingual in nature, right? And they're also, they've uh, identified a lot of trainers. They've done huge amount of train the trainer exercise, made people travel from villages, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, cities to the villages, helping people how to use those uh, POS machines as we call them, right? So, so that's the uh, change that we are seeing. When you look at 20th century, you know, the early 90s uh, up to World War II and beyond World War II, he says, you invented, let's say, we invented railroads. So what we did was, we started building more railroads, right? From, uh, from regular gauge to broad gauge. We built aer airports, we started building, you know, bigger airports. Uh, cemented um, bridges. So everything was more or bigger, bigger, scalable, right? So what was happening was the movement of industries, the movement of businesses, the kind of products and solutions that we were bringing were all predictable. The resources that we were hiring and, and creating armies of people, armies of clerks, armies of resources, we started building hierarchies. So the businesses that we were working were, were predictable, there was hierarchy, and because of hierarchy, there was a control in place, and every organization or business followed a certain routine. Right? I still remember talking about routines. Um, when I joined GE way back in 98, uh, BPO industry was just starting at that point of time. And we were also loosely called as call centers, you know, so people really didn't understand what this is all about. Uh, it took a while for uh, the ladies in the housing uh, society that I used to live in to, to really understand what I did to earn my living because they were asking my wife, saying, you know, your husband, uh, the, a cab comes in the evening, yeah, he leaves in the evening, and sometimes you don't get to see him for weeks only to be told that he's traveling to the US or he's in uh, some part of Europe. And then he comes with huge luggage, only implying, is he a smuggler or something, 
right? So people really didn't understand the concept. Why do you really have to go to work at night? Why do you really have to work on a weekend, right? So the concept of uh, organizational routines was very standard in the 20th century in infrastructure. Then he said, the whole idea of running a business was make it predictable, minimize variance, just keep adding volumes, keep adding branches, keep adding people, and that's how the business was growing. So this is the example of a push economy of 20th century. That's what John C. Lee Brown said. So what happened was, so if you see the students of economics or people who have studied stability curve, every time you launch a product or a service, you know, it, it, it starts with a pattern like this, where the service or the product you know, starts gaining a lot of growth and gains a momentum, and over a period of time, stabilizes until it tapers off, right? So the stability curve was a very definite pattern in the 20th century infrastructure. What happens, what has happened in the 21st century, the century that we are all living in? He says the 21st century infrastructure is driven by continual exponential advances of computation. We are seeing that from floppy drive to cloud services, right? And storage, bandwidth, and there is no stability that you can see in sight. I mean, do we really get wow or excited when we get to see a new model of laptop or a new model of uh, or, uh, any digital product coming our way these days? You know, because you already expect, oh my God, so how does it really different? You know, most of the mobile phones have two uh, cameras now, right? So why is it this is a, called as a selfie expert? Why is it that, you know, 20 GB worth of storage? You know, we really don't get excited as much because what's happening is there is this S curve that you see, you see it moving in rapid sets of punctuated steps. So every time a new product or a service is launched, the, even before it reaches its stability, you see a new product or a service comes in place, or a competition comes in place, or an alternative solution comes in place. So it keeps on rising the normal graph. So your rapid set of punctuated moves, which are never ending, cause what we call as a new normal. So I, I can see a lot of um, you know, people in the in, in, the, in this uh, auditorium who, who have actually seen the evolution from uh, Bharti, uh, you know, uh, uh, telephone services, right? Bharat Sanchar Nigam Limited to, to, uh, to actually uh, moving on to the pagers, moving on to, you know, phones, lap, uh, the mobile phones and beyond, right? So I, I have seen such moment, you know, I remember the first time when we got ourselves a landline phone, we celebrated, we had a dinner celebration at our home. And throughout the night, I kept on waking up to listen to the ringtone. It was the most appealing music that, of that time, you know, to be able to listen to your ringtone. Some of the youngsters will not be able to relate to it. What, I'm, what is this guy trying to say? So, but here we are saying that, you know, there's no stability. It just keeps moving, the, the, the S curve keeps moving. So, the shifts that we are seeing, that not only the S-curve is moving, we are sitting on tons and tons and tons and tons of data. Lot of information, right? Does it make sense? So what's happening is, the data is actually overwhelming us. What do we do with so much of information? So abundance is also causing lot of problem. Information overload. When we, when we used to receive our Sunday newspaper, we would finish pots of coffee or tea over reading right from the political story to the sports last page, um, you know, also including the, the sections on world view and, and movies, right? And that would be the end of our, you know, one hour spent on a Sunday morning saying, wow, so I've been able to follow up and catch up on the world's World This Week. You remember that uh, Pranay Roy's program, World This Week? So that was good enough information for us to survive for that particular week and to refer to that. Today, information is never ending. You finish a particular newspaper, there is some more information waiting for you to grasp. So we are moving from limited and fixed end to access to unlimited information. The same feeling that you and I get 
when we continue to access information on the internet on certain subject, it is never ending, right? Never ending. So here are some uh, these S curve movers. So I, I wanted to avoid Uber and Google examples and Apple examples, and I thought uh, let me show something new. If you haven't uh, heard about it, for me these were some very new um, uh, innovations. N yes, I heard someone saying 3D. Yeah. So, yeah. So so you know about this? Why don't you share? Okay, so I mean, this was very recently that I, uh, very good, yeah. So this, this is an example of a 3D printed earphone, but the, the newness to this example is that I didn't know that both our air lobes, are, um, the inner um, air, uh, are very different. They're not, they're unique by themselves, the size, right? And hence, what these guys have done, this company is called as normal. So what they have done is, they do a 3D scanning of your inner ear to decide and come up with what would be the most appropriate earphone for you, which will stay in your ear for long, will not feel uncomfortable wearing it, and that's what they are selling as a niche product called Normal. So custom made 3D earphones. Here's this company called Newton, spelled as K-N-E-W-T-O-N. What do these guys do? They focus on data analytics. Um, you know, they, they would probably try to sell their data analytics to schools like the one we are present, uh, we are present at, Dhirubhai Mbadi School. So what they would uh, say is that, we would like to monitor your child's behavior right from day one, and we would like to monitor it and map it, and try to find out what are the areas, and through scientific data analysis, what are the sports discipline or educational disciplines that your child will excel? And they come up with their algorithm-based decisions on a monthly basis, on an hourly basis, and, and they give, provide the school teachers insights into whether the child is able to learn the subject very well. Are there any similar kind of children in the classroom uh, who have similar difficulty? as this particular child in a particular subject, so that they could be given a very specific coaching, an independent coaching. So they provide a, a high degree of artificial data intelligence so that you can train your children better. Right, so that's the business model that they have come up with. There's another interesting one called eHarmony. And I was surprised to see that they have an India portal as well. This is a dating site. Now what, what does, data analytics or artificial in intelligence have to do with the dating site. The gentleman who runs this, and it's a very successful model, the gentleman who runs is Dr. Warren, he's a clinical psychologist with about 35 years of clinical psychology practice. What he's done is, and he's been a marriage counselor also, so what he's done is he's identified there are some 29 dimensions of compatibility, right, where, which makes two individuals compatible with each other, Iris, you know, right from their uh, f the physical <laughs> structure, their cultural background, their eating habits, the kind of books they read, the movies they watch. So they do that scanning of information and come back to you with, with very clear, uh, clearly identified possible dating partner, saying if you date with this individual, chances are your relationship will last longer or you will get married to this person. The other uh, new trend that we get to see is uh, uh, colonoscopy, you know, um, you know, trying uh, in the medical advances, you know, this particular pill that you take already has a camera, lens, video chip, system chip, data antenna, which the doctor can keep track of whether you're taking your medications properly, whether it's, it's really helping you, the medication is helping you, sorry? whether the medication is helping you or whether um, you, you, know, you need uh, some alternative therapy or for diagnostic purposes. So that's again, uh, you know, that's how the predictive analysis or uh, intrusive uh, technology as I call it, because it certainly intrudes into your, 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 your pers personal, personal space. So today Infosys being a large company, Reliance being a large company, there is a possibility of redeployment, there is a, always a possibility of movement from one business to the other, but is it gonna be a regular feature for everyone? 
That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And then go back to the main question again, is learning on my agenda? Right, that's very, very important. Am I making myself relevant? Here's another example, chatbots. How many of you have interacted with chatbots? I think all of us would have interacted with chatbots without knowing whether this person was, was an individual who was responding to, to, to a particular chat or was this a machine talking to me? There are a whole bunch of funny videos which are being circulated on WhatsApp where, you know, uh, where a machine is you know, having fun with, a, with an individual. But these are real things. You know, this is, you know, so this person is actually booking his uh, Hyatt Hotel uh, uh, using a chatbot where the chat is being managed by a machine, not by an individual. This particular news item, Ralph Lauren, you know, this came in uh, Harvard Business Review in 2014, saying they're working on variables. Right, and uh, they, they promised that they would be able to launch their wearable shirts by 2016. And I, I did a check on that, those shirts are available. And uh, the Polo Tech shirt, as they call them, so, so they measure your, you know, they go beyond what Fitbit does. You know, Fitbit is again an example of a wearable where you're, you know, they're monitoring your heart rate, your, the calories burned, you know, calories burned either by walking or by, uh, by using treadmill, you know, and variety of diagnostics can be done. So, so these tech shirts can actually now um, become, a, you know, something, uh, you know, they can predict uh, for, from a medical advances perspective, if you're wearing a tech shirt like this, maybe your heart attack can be prevented, you know, it can be predicted a day in advance or a few hours in advance and you are already there in the doctor's, uh, uh, you know, clinic before it actually happens. Uh, so there is a lot of, whole lot of work that is happening on the variables. It's an expensive and a long drawn uh, project because again, uh, just like Google Glass, if you've been reading about Google Glass, um, much more than just the privacy uh, aspect, I mean, the discomfort of wearing a glass or letting a person know that you probably would be recording by conversation, right, uh, is something that you know, people are struggling with. And hence, the same issue comes with wearables as well. So, so there is an evolution happening. Uh, will, will, the, will the S curve change really rapidly? Time is, uh, is, is what will tell us. So, my friends, being unique itself has become a new norm, right? It's a cultural norm. You know, so what? I mean, it's, everybody says we are unique, we are different, right? But it's become a cultural norm. So, this uh, cartoon in HBR that I picked up some time back, you know, maybe, God forbid we get into such kind of, a, you know, where the, the, doc, the doctor says actually his skill set isn't evident at this point, you know, so, so but we, when we saw the DNA mapping, you know, while you can manage the, the disease or you can predict the disease, you can probably get a skill set also. So, no, so recruiters, <laughs> be a little worried now, <laughs> what will happen to our jobs, you know, if we already know the skill set of an individual and he or she will automatically get deployed somewhere. So I spoke about SMAC as well. We spoke about SMAC uh, uh, during uh, the VUCA, that Ernst & Young slide that I was talking to you about, telecom. And uh, uh, you must be wondering, why am I showing uh, 2012 data, 2011 data? Because I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come over to it. I'd like to ask you uh, what's happening now. You know, so if this is what the data was in 2011. But yes, uh, um, you know, when they said in 2012 that by 2016 we'll have 10 billion number of mobile connected users, the fact we have on planet Earth, we have more number of mobile phones than the number of individuals, right? And Cisco's uh, report, the most recent report talks about that another four years from now, three and a half years from now, this number is gonna be close to 12 billion people. 12.8 actually to be precise. So almost 28% increase in mobile phones. So the average uh, mobile devices per head will be almost two, right? In India, they are two, <laughs> but, but across, uh, across the world, you know, that's how it seems like. So social, analytic, cloud, and mobility are, are the areas that will continue to, uh, you know, drive our future. And so I'll come back to this slide uh, uh, in form of a quiz in just a few minutes from now. So talking about mobility and talking about the fact that uh, we are looking at two mobile phones, phones per person and about 12 billion users. So here's the funny side of uh, what mobility 
uh, to what extent do we take this mobility to? All right, so uh, let's uh, talk about this particular. So here we are saying that social media, Facebook, by March 12, 2012, they predicted that Facebook would have 901 million users on this planet Earth, active users, not just registered. So 2016, what is the number? So 1.8 is the exact number. 2x the number. Just doubled in, in uh, flat four years, right? Um, Twitter, how many of you use Twitter? OK, quite a few, yeah? Twitter was about 100 million. Any idea what would be the number now? Don't use the phone, you know, it'll lose its, <laughs> lose its uh, charm, yeah, of, of doing a quiz. So again, you know, 4x kind of a number. Uh, LinkedIn, 161 million. Where are we now? It's 320 close to, I mean, to, you know, about three, 340. So again, two times. So that's, that's how uh, Smack is making an impact. I mean, so the reason I'm sharing these numbers with you is essentially the point is that if we are not on these platforms or if you are not leveraging these platforms, uh, then we are missing out on something, right? So that's important. Yeah. So from a learning space as well, from a learning, so you can follow a variety of leaders on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is no more just a, a, a social media tool to connect with people. Uh, it also helps you um, access jobs. It also helps you uh, learn. So they recently acquired a company called Lynda.com, right? And now it's called as LinkedIn Learning. Right? I'll talk about it a little uh, in, in the upcoming slides. So you can also pick up a lot of learning programs using these social media tools. And through Twitter, you can follow a variety of leaders, variety of subjects that are more uh, you know, close to your heart. And you can, you can actually get online tweets of the authors or the people who are authorities of that particular subject. All right, so part two of uh, the program is where again we continue to focus on the internal capability. So when we talk about so many changes with products, solutions, uh, thought processes, the way the world is evolving, the way the future forecast is being made, what about learning? What's happening in the learning space? What are the changes that we are seeing in the learning arena? So the, the new age learner profile, and believe me, it is not nothing to do with I mean, slightly, I'll stand corrected, slightly to do with the age group, but majority of it is due to the changes, the ecosystem, the changes that we are seeing around us. So what's happening is we learn more through informal methods, and that also links to John Seeley Brown's uh, theory of the Montessori theory. Uh, we learn more through multimedias, through games, simulations, you know, so there are a lot of games which have been created uh, to learn about strategy, to learn about finance. So it is not necessary that games and simulations are only meant for a certain age group or younger. Uh, and people learn more in a relaxed environment. So an environment like this, which is very conducive to, to interaction, which is very conducive to, to, uh, to debate, is what people love. And also, very, very important is, what is the relevance? Why am I studying this? Why am I learning this? That is a core question that each one of us is being asked. So irrespective of whether you are wearing a hat of a leader or you're wearing a hat of a L&D head or a trainer, your, the person with whom you are interacting with may not openly ask you, but indirectly is questioning you and saying, why are, why are you asking me to do this particular task? Or why do you want me to? you know, manage this particular email in this format? Or why do you want me to address this project in a different manner, right? So what is the relevance? That's what the new age learner profile is. And informal learning is, is becoming a big way to, to really augment yourself, you know. Uh, look at the way um, our younger, um, you know, lot is learning uh, skills on music, on, on managing the pets, or you know, you know, so I have children at home, you know, my daughter um, learns so many things through YouTube, you know, and even I pick up a lot of information through YouTube or, um, you know, besides just 
you know i enjoy uh, cooking as well so if you have to pick up some culinary information if you have to if you're traveling to a new country altogether if you're traveling to a new geography altogether there's so much of information and insight available once my leader telling me saying that amit i want you to travel to this location and and just uh, do some mystery shopping and uh, this was a competitions product and i was wondering why is he asking me to do all of this he didn't use the word mystery shopping i learned about it later but uh, and for a first one or two days i felt quite useless and i said you know why on earth is he sending me to such a location and only when you actually visit only when you get out of your comfort zone and try to explore newer alternatives talking to different people you know getting ideas from very different kind of uh, you know uh, experiences um i'll 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 talk about adjacencies a little later but i think it's important for me to bring that uh, subject here itself i recall saurav gangli once uh, decided to uh, when his captaincy was being questioned he decided to um, go back to learning football football so he started picking up very specific professional lessons on football not just to become a good football player he didn't wanted to move uh, away from cricket but what he did was by studying and learning football his aggression which was missing on the field uh, in terms of being able to you know uh, collect the number of wickets uh, to be able to finish the task on time he was because it's a 90 minute sport vis a vis a uh 20 over or a 50 over or a 5 day program or a, a game so he picked up his learnings by getting out of his own comfort zone and getting into a sport which was adjacent to what his core sport was so i think you i wish um, you know you would have picked up some learnings from here itself so changes that we are seeing now especially in the learning space and since we deal with workforce of uh, tomorrow that people have started moving from teacher centered to learning centered so it doesn't matter where you are who the teacher is where you are learning from whether you picked up that knowledge from youtube whether you picked it up from a moocs a massively open online course or whether you actually uh, went and did some some exploration yourself spending time on on a computer it is all learning centered the moment we understand that you know the learning can happen from wherever you know i think our dialogue with our people will improve big time and the notion that you know you know all learners will learn together you know some of the skills you can actually get them to learn together right but the to be fixed with that particular notion saying that you know uh, that all of them will have the same learning path is something which is a myth and we must be cognizant and aware of that each one of us learns through through our own path some of us take time some of us are quick learners some of us are visual learners some of us are auditory learners some of us are uh, contextual learners we really need to um, you know understand the context before we start joining the dots one size fits all versus one size fits one so personalization of learning is also becoming a very very important so each individual has its own learning goals his own learning thought processes are you aware of that are you being uh, sensitive to that that he has a very unique and a specific need and instead of saying we will learn um, excel or we will learn powerpoint you know we are going to talk about you know how can we make our business more powerful how can we make our revenue improve how can we prevent financial leakages so that's why we are teaching you advanced excel so when you are talking about the task and not about the topic you will be able to generate more connect with your audience so topic versus task course content versus situational context so don't feed me with you know yesterday i was talking to uh, the president of uh, uh, reliance uh, uh, global services and he uh, uh, he was talking about the fact that he wants speed learning uh, raghuraman was talking about speed learning he was talking about saying can we you know uh, condense the learning can we make it can we make it applicable on monday so if you have learned a new skill can that be applied on monday right so so that's the kind of a thought process which uh, 
people are talking about saying situational context is so very important uh, rather than you know looking at the entire you know courseware so if you are able to teach a person how to run a particular um, so i'm not I, I i fondly remember my ge days i'm not a statistician i never studied maths but those two years in ge taught me anything and everything about six sigma and the application of six sigma so i can talk for hours on standard deviation and variance though i don't have any a uh, statistical uh, degree or a diploma with me now how did that happen because the situational context so they sent me to us within a week of my joining but they ensured they, they missed out on my induction training saying you know you will learn your induction here's your induction manual so it's a 30 hour journey for you from here to us you will read it but we want to teach you six sigma because we don't want you to look bad in front of the client knowing nothing about what dmac is what you know uh, standard variation is right so that's how uh, you know the the it's important that the course you know we should not be worried about whether you know you've completed that particular course or whether you've been able to do an end to end are you able to equip the person for the task at hand that is extremely important and more so in the vuca world where you really have to address the problems um, you know as of yesterday learning than doing a typical college scenario that we all have gone through most of us have gone through visa v doing then learning you know so so we we i remember again in ge we had self managed teams these teams were identified saying that you know you don't need a leader because you have you have performed well in the past you've done a good job we see that your 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 line of thinking is a mature line of thinking and we allow you to work on your own without a leader come back to us only if you really are in dire straits you have a major problem so when you when you actually and then identifying who are the right leaders from this team after they have performed well is the way forward that's how most of the organizations have started looking at classroom time versus real time so nobody talks about the number of hours that you've put in in a particular classroom or for a diploma it's about what is that real essence that you picked up when you attended a particular session or you you applied a certain knowledge you applied a certain experience that is very very important you see a huge change in in the way we used to think earlier subject matter experts with no disrespect to subject matter experts but now you need problem solving networks the problems have become very 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 complicated so you can't just be dependent on only one subject matter expert or two subject matter expert you really need to have a network of colleagues and friends who can give you diverse thought processes different ideas and and i use linkedin shamelessly it's such a beautiful tool honestly i don't represent linkedin from any form i don't hold any stocks of linkedin right but it's such a beautiful such a powerful tool that you can actually reach out to your own networks uh, and uh, i remember before traveling for an overseas conference i wrote to uh, almost about 50 60 different clos and about 14 of them responded with some very good ideas i said look i'm traveling to taipei i have this is the subject that i'm going to talk about can you give me some ideas can you give me some thought processes so people come back so that's what i call as problem solving network so you really need to build so the the question to you is to each one of us is what are we doing in 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 building those networks are we are we networking enough are we meeting people enough my uh, ex ceo of uh, um, infosys used to say that you know um, uh, he would ask how many new professionals colleagues did you meet last month so did you eat coffee uh, dinner with somebody have a did you have a coffee with somebody else in the cafeteria if you are not meeting people if you are not making new connections then you are not on a leadership mode then you are in a silos mode so it's important to build these networks you really don't know what time when these networks when you activate them will come to your rescue will come to your help and that is what gives a huge amount of professional satisfaction i'm sure you will agree when you are able to solve problems when you are able to address issues right so that's the uniqueness of uh, networks and teaching push versus learning pull so i don't think anyone uh, pushed you or there was a diktat from the management that you have to be here at dhirubhai ambani school on on 7th of february at 4:30 pm otherwise it will have an impact on your appraisals right so it's a classic example of 
learning pull you know are you really uh, intrigued with the idea are you really would you really like to understand the subject would you like to learn more skills and this is a great opportunity that you know before the session after the session will also allow us some amount of networking opportunity sharing a cup of coffee with the next colleague or a new friend that is equally important so learning pull is is gaining a huge importance so teacher centered versus learning centered so the world has now reversed it doesn't focus more on the teacher as much as it focus on the learner and uh, remember the days of teacher authority school days right and i love this term called as the learner autonomy friends we are so blessed we are so blessed that we are living in a world we are living in an era where the learners have an autonomy to choose what they really want to do you have access to information you have access to networks you have access to people so this is an era of learner autonomy and not of a teacher authority so you can decide what to learn when to learn how to learn i i i'm not just provoking you on on these subjects but i'll also share in my subsequent slides you know what are the various um, avenues that are there for us to to pick up our learning some of those avenues like linkedin learning i've already spoken about content uh, is important is the king but if you do not create content with context in mind then people will again lose attention and we we the more uh, that we get to see all my experiences tell me the attention spans are dwindling by the day including us the amount of data influx that we have the amount of um, you know uh, messaging the prompts that we get is is really really not funny so context also is very important and there is a significant shift uh, which is away from classroom to self learning we spoke about that and the reason why we are talking about self learning is again technology is playing a very very important role a very integral role in this here's again an extreme example uh, taken from a movie but uh, you know as they say whatever is there in your mind if your mind can conceive it is a possibility here's another important uh, subject that i wanted to uh, you know bring attention your attention towards is learning half life you know i remember the half life uh, during my glaxo days that you know the reason why the doctors prescribe different medication saying you take this antibiotic twice a day or once a day or thrice a day depending on the half life of the the drug in it right so because after every if the half life is 4 hours after every 4 hours half of the drug will pass through your excretory system right and it'll get excreted and hence the effect on the bacteria will last only that much and hence you need another another dose until i got exposed to a new half life a learning half life it's the theory says that you know whatever we learned in our colleges or whatever we learned 10 years ago only half of it is is applicable today right any guesses what would that half be a couple of years ago a couple of years ago it was 10 years so 10 years whatever you learned 10 years ago half of it is applicable even today but now the half life has shrunk and it is shrinking by the day so whatever you learn any guesses how many months or how many weeks any guesses huh? it changes every day but the half life you know so the Association of Training and Development that I am associated with did a study a few years ago, and they found out that the half life of learning has shrunk from ten years to eighteen months. Right. So, and this was a study that they did about two years ago or three years ago. So, I am very sure that it would have shrunk even further. Maybe um, my personal view is about eight nine months. You know. Uh, so that's the. Uh, so we need to be very very aware of. what we are learning what is the relevance and how much of it can be applied now if it cannot be applied now then what am i doing why am i studying that particular subject right so we are moving from iq we all know right intelligence quotient we moved from iq to eq 
So people used to say that, you know, IQ is not the only important thing. The person has to be emotionally stable as well. If he can't build relationships, then he may be an, a top-notch engineer from uh, Harvard, but uh, will not work with teams because he can't. He doesn't have a good uh, control over his emotions. So from there, we have now moved to CQ. Any guesses what CQ is? Culture. Raise your hand. Maybe this may earn you a chocolate. So being curious is also linked to the fact that you are inclusive in nature. When you're reaching out somebody, you're also taking away that ego from your end saying that, you know, I know it all. Hey, can you please tell me something about this? Hey, I've got stuck in this area. I've never in my entire career, um, you know, felt, um, f um, you know, um, a little restricted by saying, you know, what will my juniors think about me? if I go and ask them this particular question, right? But my travels to the Western world and interaction with people in the West, there, it is so common for people to say, I don't know about this. They don't feel offended. Or they will reach out to somebody who, who, whom they believe has an answer for it. Hey, Rick, can you please help me uh, untangle uh, from this web? I'm stuck here. Hey, Joe, can you please help me here, right? or it's my bad day today, my, my CPU is not working. These are the kind of terms that you hear from people in the Western world when you have those conversations. So when you become more inclusive, when you become more aware of the fact that there are people with different cultures, different uh, backgrounds, and you demonstrate hunger to learn, hunger to seek insights, I think that's where it, it um, you know, thaws all kinds of um, you know, cold relationships, it, it uh, brings people together, it makes the conversation more powerful, it makes the, um, the whole experience very, very uh, uh, you know, uh, enjoyable. It makes the experience more and more enjoyable. So CQ is the new mantra. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't focus on IQ and EQ, but if you have the CQ, you will find answers because we are living in a world of abundance. We are living in a world where data is accessible to us. You don't have to anymore book a library slot or book a particular book um, you know, or, or reach out to a particular person who's available only at a particular time. You have access to this information. So CQ is extremely important. This brings me to another interesting subject where John Seeley Brown uh, talks very, very high about. And he says, uh, he uses the word entrepreneurial learning. Now learning is, all of us know, but what is entrepreneurial learning? So there's a connect to business. So when you use entrepreneurship, I think if I collect all your thoughts, then the answer would come, evolve, is, is about when you look at learning as something through which you will be able to generate not just wisdom, but revenue. And I'll give you an example. Sorry, you have any one question? Okay, so and I'll give you an example. So what John Seeley Brown did was, is a story he, he, he narrates uh, of a small island called Maui. It's spelled as M-A-U-I. It's near Hawaii, the, the, you know, the, all those small islands near Hawaii. So what he narrates the story of this gentleman called Dusty Payne, who's, uh, um, you know, who's uh, a surfer, a sea surfer. And this gentleman, what he did was, this particular community, though they are so, they live next to such a beautiful ocean, Pacific Ocean, yet on the world map, you know, until about 2012, they were not known for surfing. While they were, you know, surfing was in their DNA. So if the same HBR video, the, the cartoon that you saw, where an ultrasound is happening, the, the doctor would have very, very clearly said that, you know, these guys are surfers. So despite being in their, in their genes, they were not really, really making it uh, to the world surfing uh, records. What this gentleman did was, he demonstrated, he took a bunch of youngsters in the age group of 14 to 16, and then he demonstrated that through the question, questioning, you know, by making these surfers question, probing, you know, he showed them videos of world-class surfers. He took them into his, his, uh, his uh, training center, showed them the old videos, stop, 
pause, uh, pause action, pause action. He kept showing them, you know, different uh, angles with which these surfers were uh, were um, playing the sport, and ask them to, you know, be curious about asking and framing multiple questions. That's what an entrepreneur does as well. Tries to find out, right? Then he says they also helped connect with each other in engaging. So what he did was. Besides these videos, he also encouraged these learners to talk to the world class uh, surfers themselves. So sometimes he would invite those surfers to, to, to their location and sometimes by collecting donations he would be able to send these young surfers to, uh, to, to the locations of uh, these uh, sportsmen. And then the videos also helped with reflection. They also were able to reflect and see, so what he did was, he made them, uh, you know, he created videos of these surfers surfing on the ocean and then showed them, the, replayed those videos to them uh, sometime later and, and asked them to see for themselves where did they make a mistake, which area did they make a mistake. So when you reflect, then you get to learn a lot more without a person actually telling you this is the area that you made a mistake. The other unique thing that an entrepreneur does is always the concept of play. So when you ask a particular entrepreneur, why is he into this particular business? Because he wants to, he wants adventure, he wants play, he wants to get fun out of what he's trying to do. He's not happy with the nine to five environment. That's a common thread that you will see in most of the entrepreneurs. So entrepreneur learners uh, are always questing. He also was connect, very high on connect. He was very high on reflecting what we were asking. So he made notes so that we can, he could get that validation and he always found play in the system. We all have repetitive jobs, all of us, but it is our own responsibility to find those moments of playfulness, even at our you know, so-called boring routine, be it at a cafeteria, be it at a, uh, on, the, on the workspace and say, hey, I, I was thinking about this problem the whole weekend, you know, can we address it a little differently, you know, talking to your friend about it looking at different solutions. So entrepreneurial learners don't really need to set up their own enterprise all the time. You can exercise and demonstrate entrepreneurial learning even in your daily work environment. So can these dispositions be taught? Can these be taught in a classroom? The answer is they cannot be taught. There is no such course on how to build learning dispositions, how to make yourself more playful, but it, they can be cultivated. Cultivated by you as a leader, by you demonstrating as a leader that, uh, ex you know, ex exhibiting that kind of playfulness, exhibiting that kind of curiosity, exhibiting that kind of reflective mindset, and, and, and giving the, the right kind of a voice to the people. I'm a big fan of reverse mentoring. I did comment on it briefly though, that I don't really mind in going back to my younger team and saying, hey, I'm stuck in this issue, right? Um, Sunil Bharti Mittal from Airtel, um, I was reading about his case study um, some time ago, where every month he encourages young team members to come and coach him. Tell him what is going wrong in Airtel. What are the schemes that are not doing very well, right? And he, he promises them there will be no repercussions, you know. So he allows people to speak their mind. That's a classic case of being mentored or through, not necessarily people who are, who are elder to you are the ones who, who can mentor you. So reverse mentoring is important. Peer-based learning is gaining huge importance. We really have to uh, look at this very, very seriously. I've given you some examples I shared with you uh, of how I use LinkedIn how I use my peer cohort, where you actually, um, you know, uh, seek answers through your friends at, at work, friends within the same community. So most of the organizations today uh, have started realizing that they need to have a pervasive learning ecosystem. Now, what do you mean by pervasive learning ecosystem? That as an organization, I'll provide classroom training, I'll provide internet-based training, uh, Reliance has Skillsoft, yeah, they're using GetAbstract, you, you guys uh, are accessing that. 
informal way of learning, learning through sessions like this. So a pervasive learning system gives formal, informal and social uh, learning. So any organization which is able to provide such three tiered approaches um, is able to uh, build a workforce for future. So as leaders you need to think are you really uh, providing such kind of an environment to your people. So these uh, learning avenues like I said get abstract is one such avenue that you can you can certainly leverage it's a great tool. Um, LinkedIn learning is again a great tool so for example here I typed uh, leadership it threw almost about 600 courses on leadership short term courses. Uh, Udemy is again massively open online course. Udemy is again a very good one. Coursera is another good one. So there are enough and more avenues for you. However, I'm sure you'll agree, ownership of learning is your responsibility. Throwing it as a responsibility that you know it is my organization, they have to provide me with so many learning days, they have to provide me with that. I think it's gone are those days. Yes, organizations are keen and are providing a lot of opportunities. But you have to be responsible. It's your responsibility. Technology is also dehumanizing the transactions. So that's my view. So while I'm a big fan of technology aided learning, I've been talking about technology uh, all this while, but it also dehumanizes transactions. So hence, it's equally important that we do bring uh, uh, you know, human beings as and when that is required. Right? So technology can't solve all the problems. Right, so talking about relationships, so I remember having done negotiations, a, a workshop on negotiation skills, where this leader was teaching us how through a handshake, the quality of handshake, you can decide or you can get a signal whether your negotiation is moving in the right direction or not. Now that you can't learn through technology, that you can't learn over Skype, right, or over a webinar. So, so technology has its own pluses, but at the same time, has its own limitations. So when we talk of um, inputs like domain centricity, process training, product training, what business are you representing? Are you really an expert in that area? If you're not an expert in that area, then that's something that you really need to become one. Very, very important. So besides the technology element that, you know, that in some cases technology does not work, if you don't understand my domain, you will not be able to succeed. So questioning yourself, you know, why? That's so very important. Why the charts are moving like this? Why this person is talking to me like this? Why this particular behavior changed? You know, rather than just reacting immediately, get more trees, get more pulp, right? Uh, so that's, so technology has its own limitations. It can provide you with tons of data, but what you do is, that's where each one of us is required for the businesses, right? So finally, the CLO, the chief learning officers that I've been interacting with, here are some perspectives and some of those key takeaways that you can pick up from. So very clearly, they're saying that, you know, the learning concierge, you know, as you go to a hotel, you find a concierge. If you're new to the city, he helps you book a, uh, a you know, a theater ticket. He helps you get flowers. He helps you with a lot of other things. I think that's, that's what many CLOs believe that the world around us, as the companies evolve, we will have learning concierges in the organizations who will be your guides. They will not necessarily wear the L&D hat, but they will be your guides and tell you how to learn, where to learn, where to get this information from. Uh, learning on the tap, you know, just like, you know, you go to a bar and you, you know, you know, get your drinks on the tap, you can get learning from wherever you are, whatever location you are in. You really don't have to be restricted with a classroom environment. Uh, shift from training to learning, we saw that. Uh, sensitivity to learning will grow big time. Uh, CEOs will relate to invisible outcomes and not just look at only that, you know, what, what programs did you do, how many hours did you invest in a particular training, what are the outcomes? Um, and learning will be critical uh, on the CEO agenda. You know, every CEO today is talking about learning. Shift from content to contextually curated material, right? We spoke about it in, in detail that, you know, context is extremely important. So this is what, um, you know, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Tony, believes that, you know, the content is really going to be more contextualized. Um, role of our current jobs will be taken over by artificial intelligence. So hence, our role as L&D specialists will be curator of the useful information, 
not necessarily stake claim that you know this is something that I created. You just curate that information. What you see today in this evening is an example of curation of information taken from multiple resources and joining all, all the threads together. And hence you become a human performance specialist rather than just being a, uh, a training uh, person. Focusing on the right brain, focusing on emotional quotient, development will continue. Um, accelerated development, you know, Raghu Raman's perspective that we spoke about that he wants, you know, whatever you learn to be applied on Monday. So accelerated learning development specialists using data, using artificial in intelligence is going to be the way of life for future. Uh, we may know methods, uh, we will get to see newer tools, newer technologies for quick knowledge acquisition. So the matrix video that you saw, it's a knowledge acquisition video, you know, so, so while that was an extreme, but you will be able to acquire knowledge at a much shorter spa uh, space of uh, time. Uh, technology will uh, provide us real-time feedback. That's what Ariu, uh, Andrew Warren Smith says. Uh, collaboration across borders, across cultures is extremely important. We cannot say that we are an Indian organization anymore. We, we have to have a multinational mindset. Very, very important. Classroom training in 2025 will be as popular as fax machine currently, right? Uh, but I still believe that uh, classroom will stay you know, it, it, it will not lose its relevance, but it will be introduced as and when required. Data and information will provide much of the knowledge that people require to be successful, but capturing experiences is going to be extremely, extremely important. So getting those networks, the subject matter experts together, that's going to be very, very important. Coaching will emerge in a big way. Uh, today, coaching has been uh, accessible to very few. Uh, but with advance of technology, with advancement, you find a variety of coaches available over Skype, over Zoom, over a variety of platforms. So coaching is going to be uh, the next future. And simulated environments, short-term assignments, uh, projects will help uh, learn, le make the learning stick. But as I said, don't forget the human interaction. As much as we believe that the way we learn will change dramatically, we cannot leave Everything and anything on the learner, it has to be a knowledge era uh, based kind of a work. People will have to interact frequently with one another, not just with the machines. You saw the problems with only interacting with machines and interpersonal skills are a must. We have to have interactions with people. So in summary, self-awareness need to stay relevant. Self-awareness of the fact that we need to stay relevant, including me. All of us need to have an enhanced focus on learning. Multiple opportunities and multiple approaches you know, are, are acceptable. So we spoke about variety of approaches, right? You don't have to follow only one school of thought. And learner-centered environment, environment will be given the right importance. So my friends, do we have enough reasons to bring back learning on our agenda? So thank you so much for your, uh, for your uh, Lovely participation, and uh, and 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 also uh, you know hearing my perspectives.